they've just asked me uh, why I'm wearing this because everybody else has took them off. I'm 84 years of age, so I've got this on so I don't forget who I am. <laughs> I want to take you back to 1950. That's when I uh, left school, like every other kid who I knew, and um, left school on the Friday night and went into work on the Monday morning. In my particular case, I went to, uh, I was a builder, an apprentice bricklayer. And one of my first jobs as an apprentice bricklayer was on a hospital in, uh, in Manchester. And that morning, the, 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 my gaffer said, go and get us a, a bucket of water. So off I sat with my bucket and I wandered into this ward. It was full of children, all boys. Um, and they all looked quite happy saying they were in the hospital. There was a big table in the middle of the ward and they were all playing, they were all playing games on the, on, on, the, on the table. Some were in, talking in little groups, some were just lying on the bed reading, some were just lying on the bed. And they all looked um, quite healthy. But I noticed that they'd all got, they hadn't got any hair. They were all bald. The... Um, the matron said to me, they've got this thing called leukemia, which I'd never heard of. And the treatment, which I found out later, um, was chemotherapy, and that's why they, they had no hair. That's devastating enough, but what was even more devastating, that what she said next, and she said, none of these boys will live past the age of 21. I, it was shock, and, and I didn't know what to do. I'm 15 years of age. I mean, my biggest responsibility, we're going to get in a bucket of water. But something must have stuck in the archives of my mind, um, because later on, much later, coming to the, my 40th birthday, I thought about these kids. And I thought, how can I raise money for them? And I was always fortunate enough to, that we launched, if you like, the, use the word launch, the fitness industry. And I had a club over here in Bolton that was far ahead of its competitors. Well, it didn't have any competitors because we were the first on the, the scene to put in a health club together with creche and beauty salon. And uh, um, we had this thing called exercise to music uh, that later would morph into, 10 years later, would morph into aerobics and a lot of other things. We'd got squash courts. So what could I do to raise money for these kids? And I thought, I'll, why, why do I promote this business? Because nobody knew what a health club was in Bolton. We're at the end of the Industrial Revolution. Everybody worked with their hands on the back, so they didn't think they needed exercise. So I come up with this idea that I would do something on my 40th birthday, just to show that uh, we were examples of what we were trying to sell, which was fitness. So on my 40th birthday, I ran 40 miles, I lifted 40,000 pounds in weight on a makeshift gym on the town hall square, just around the corner from here. I played four people at squash, one of them the legendary Jonah Barrington, six times world champion. One of them our own soccer player, um, Francis Lee, who played for England and Manchester City. Rodney Marsh, who played for England and Manchester City, was another of my four opponents. And the fourth, uh, the fourth, um, guy that I played uh, was a commentator for Radio, Radio Manchester and he just wanted to get in the act and tell the story. Uh, straight after the squash I, I did 400 consecutive sit-ups and just to show that at 40 years of age we weren't finished and we weren't on the slippery slope to old age and dementia, you need to think, think who your own name is. I, uh, we decided, Brenda and myself, my wife, who's in the audience, that we would take all the people who'd helped us to raise money and take them home and celebrate the night away and toast the dawn with strawberries, champagne and bacon butties. And my wife always insisted that we put brown sauce on. Just to show that we weren't getting old and that we weren't going to be diminishing and sliding down that slope. At 50 years of age, I, I ran 50 miles, played, um, ran 50 miles, lifted 50,000 pounds in weight on the town hall square in 50 minutes, 
went across to our health club that had two squash courts, played five international athletes at squash, and then did 500 sit-ups. And just to show that we were, we were fit, and that it hadn't had it took its toll on the day, uh, Brenda and I took all the people who had helped us to raise money for cancer research and leukemia in kids, and uh, 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 partied all night and toasted the dawn with champagne, strawberries, and bacon butties. And don't forget the brown sauce. In between that, wedged in between that, I decided that I was going to run from John O'Groats to Land's End. And uh, I was 46 years at the time. BBC television covered it in its entirety, so no pressure there. Uh, and I started off at the top end so I could run downhill. Um, and uh, I'd had to do three, over three marathons a day in order to break what this record was, which we don't know whether there's a record or not. But anyhow, I, I, I had to run it in three days. I'd made the schoolboy error in that the night before we set off, Chris Brasher, who's the, um, the reputation with the four-minute mile and one of a um, Ibbotson's pacemakers, and the, uh, um, the, the, the um, he, he, he launched in a, a shoe called New Balance. So he, he sent uh, me a, six pairs of shoes, this new product called New Balance. And I couldn't let Chris down, so I thought I'll wear the shoes, and you shouldn't do that because you've got to break the shoes in. I did 80 miles on that first day, no problems whatsoever. I remember arriving in Bonner Bridge, and I was to be greeted by the, the, the mayor and the sheriff of the county and the, a, a band playing uh, the bag, bagpipe band. And I got there before the band. <laughs> so I had to wait, wait round the corner until the band arrived before I could run into the square pretending I'm just finishing my run. And then, of course, continued running down through, uh, through Scotland, going over the fourth bridge, from the fourth bridge for Carlisle, from Carlisle getting on the A6, running down the A6, uh, up Shapfell, and, uh, which is a 16-mile climb, down into uh, the A A6 again, going through Lancaster, Lancaster, Preston, Preston to uh, um, Warrington, Warrington down to... Um, uh, to, to Iron Bridge at, in Shropshire. I'd covered 559 miles, and the, the result of having an Achilles tendon pulled me out. I'd, been, I'd run for 400 miles on an injury through uh, wearing new shoes. People ask, you see, why do you do it? Why do you go through and put yourself put through all this pain and, and all that training and, and everything? Part of it is because you wanted to show an example of what fitness, what fitness is and what fitness was. Uh, but perhaps the answer to that comes from a poster um, that I had in a gym, a small dust bowl of a gym that I called Chancery Lane Barbell Club in the early 1960s. Um, and um, the gym, it was 27 feet long, it was 14 feet across, it had flagged floors, it had whitewashed walls, it had two light bulbs, it had no running water, it had no changing rooms, and significantly, it had no women. No women worked out in the gyms in them days. You had more sense, you women, than do subject yourself to conditions like that. Uh, and I'm sitting there one night, and it's, it, no customers have been in. 350 square feet, remember, it's not very big. The size of a living room in a semi-detached house. And I'm sat there on the bench and I'm thinking, there's got to be something better than this. I'm depressed because I've had no customers in. And I'm ready for getting up and I'm ready for going out and locking up and going, going home. And I stood up and I, there's a poster to, to my left that I'd put up maybe two years before. And the poster simply said, if you think you can, you can. And I don't know what prompted this, but my arms went out like that, and, and, and I don't know. Subconsciously, it was telling me something. It was saying that I needed space. And I looked at the poster again, and it said, if you think you can, you can. And four years later, I did. And I opened this health club, which was 10,000 square feet, from 350 square feet to 10,000. 
and we filled it with all kinds of facilities. A fabulous health club that was leading the way in this country as far back as 1970. I want to progress on now because there's another two examples that I, I show on why you do these things. I started raising money for cancer research with those kids in, in, in 1940, and I'm still raising money for cancer research today. And um, in order to tell you that story, I want to take you back to 1945. And to be more specific, May the 8th, 1945, and to be even more specific, three o'clock in the afternoon, and this is very important. Because at three o'clock in the afternoon, on May the 8th, 1945, Winston Churchill would announce the end of World War II. And he would be on the, at three o'clock in the afternoon, he would be talking about hopes and aspirations and how we had a great future in front of us. But three miles down the road, at Swinton Colliery, a thousand feet down and a mile to the coal face, Joe Heathcote, my dad, was hacking away at that face and shoveling coal onto the conveyor belt. And as he was, as Winston Churchill was saying, we've got hope and aspirations and we're looking to the future, the roof came in and brought me dad's back in three places. He always said he was very lucky because it didn't sever the spine and he would walk again. And he said to me, and what he did, and it would take until, Jan until December of that year, December of 1955, before he was walking. And he'd always said to me, and he had a passion for this, he wanted me to learn how to swim. I, I, on that day, I remember us walking through the snow. It was a cold, cold night. It was the last Friday in December, 1945, and he got walking again, and the first thing he wanted to do was take me to the baths. That was Farnworth Baths in King Street, in Farnworth. And I remember trudging through the snow and going into the bath and going into the changing room and, and um, uh, changing and getting into our swimming trunks and we went out to the pool only to see that no one else in the pool from the swimming club was going to swim that night. You see, the, co the, the, the baths hadn't had a delivery of coal for nearly two weeks and the water hadn't been heated up at all. And it was an old Victorian building with a glass roof and it hadn't held any heat. We found out later that the water would be about four to five degrees, just above freezing. All these top swimmers who I envied were out there, the sweaters on and the coats on, trying to keep warm and not go in the water. My dad looked at them and I looked at them and they looked at us and my dad looked at me and then he just said, Come on, Kenneth, let's just do one length. And in we went. And to this day, it's the fastest length that I've ever <laughs> seen. We got out at the other end and we're shivering and we're cold and we're walking by. All these swimmers who I admired, I could even name you the, 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 the teams at that, that time. People I really did look up to. And we're walking by them and my dad just, said to me very, very quietly as we're walking by, he said, do you know, Kenneth, you've got to be in it to win it. You've just beaten this lot tonight. And then he said something else, which goes back to the poster. He said, you know, if you think you can do it, you can do it. And he obviously had, because we swam that length. I now want to fast forward 72 years I'm 82, that's two years ago, two years ago. And I'd pledged for cancer research that I would do three mega swims that year. The first one I would swim the Great North Swim, which is, um, uh, which is in Lake Windermere, that's 3.1 miles. Uh, the next swim will be the length of Kit Lake Coniston, which is 5.2 miles, pier to pier, point to point straight down the middle. And then the final swim would be the full length at late, of Lake Windermere at 82 years of age. I remember Brenda and I motoring up the, the, the end six. It was pouring down. It was, the wind was blowing. Uh, it was rough all the way up. We got into Ambleside and we booked into the Regent Hotel 
which is directly across from the pier. And um, it had rained all through the evening meal. It rained all night. It rained um, and beat in the windows with this four-six wind that, was, uh, that had whipped up. And I remember getting up and having my two Weetabix and my two cups of tea and a banana and then walking out of the Regent Hotel with me back to the door to see the boat at the end of the... Um, uh, at the end of the pier that was going to steer me across Lake Windermere, all the full ten and a half miles. And uh, I got up to the pier, the wind's beating into my face. I'm starting to feel a bit nervous at this stage. And I got onto the pier and I shouted out to Dave Quatermain and Karen Smith, where do I get in? And my voice being carried away with the wind. You've got to go off the pier, came the words back again being carried away with the wind. I went back to where the pier meets the land and I got into the, into the water, immediately sank into my knees in mud and sludge and moved over and grabbed over the hold of the pier and I started to pu pull myself forward. And I'd got to about this depth in the water and I'd lost it. I'd got it, it had gone. I could see the choppiness. I had to swim that full 10 miles. It was an emptiness in front of me. I felt that I could have reached up and touched the clouds that were that low. There was no way. There was no way that I wanted to get in that water. I just didn't want to do it. I'm thinking, somebody come and rescue me. Tell me I can't do it. The weather's too bad. And then out of nowhere came my dad. And he said, Come on, Kenneth, let's just do one length. And off I went, and I got not a word of a lie. I was laughing when I went into the water. Not for very long, I understand. It <laughs> took me nine hours, 55 minutes to do that swim. I remember touching the pier at Felfoot. I'd done it. I was totally, totally exhausted. Every wave hit you the right hand side of your face. And I thought of three things. I thought of those kids with leukemia that wouldn't reach the age of 21. I thought of my dad. And I thought of that poster that said, if you think you can, you can. And that applies to us all. Whether the challenges are real, our own challenges, the challenges that we, all, we can cut, whether we need to or whether we don't, and how we see things through. And they say that positive thinking is better if you stood up. So I want you to stand up. Can everybody stand up? And I want you to just recite this one line that says, if you think you can, you can. So let's hear it. If you think you can, you can. You can laugh and you can feel self-conscious, but say it. If you think you can, you can. If you think you can, you can. If you think you can, you can. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Do I come off now? Thank you.